So in this segment, we're going to talk about a couple of things. Um, we're going to actually accelerate a, a real workflow. And I believe we have um, Taylor, uh, Taylor Groves in, in, in attendance, and we're, we're going to walk through the workflow that he's generously allowed us to, to use as a, as a guinea pig for how we can take a CPU workflow, evaluate it, understand it, and convert it to run on the GPU with Rapids, and then get some serious speed up. So thank you, Taylor. Um, if, if, he's, if you're here, I, I don't think I can see the participants right now, but I would love for you to give a brief you know, overview of your workflow, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Um, so this workflow at NERSC, we collect a lot of counters on our systems um, running every second. There's, you know, probably about, I don't know, two, well, I don't know, 1,400, 2,000 counters per switch we have on the system, um, collecting data every second that gives us information about how the network performed. And so my background is looking at uh, our high-speed network performance and trying to improve that. So uh, loading in all this data on the CPU takes a lot of time. You know, this ends up being um, terabytes and terabytes or even maybe a petabyte of data uh, that we have. And, and just analyzing that and um, converting the data from the, the very hardware specific counters to things that are meaningful for analysis was taking quite a bit of time on the CPU. So that was where uh, Nick and NVIDIA uh, volunteered to, uh, to see how they could help us out in speeding that up. Hopefully that's a, that's a good introduction. Awesome, yeah, thanks so much. So, okay, so with that, um, we're gonna go through this workflow and then actually do the port live, um, you know, because everyone always says live coding is always a good idea. So we're gonna do that. And then, you know, hopefully get some, you know, brief moments during this, we're gonna take some stock and say like, this is why this makes sense. This is the way we're thinking about this and how to think about structuring workflows for the GPU, because often it's a little bit different than thinking about the CPU. Um, so when we get a workflow like this, um, you know, Taylor was again, um, nice enough to provide it and work with us and explain it and, and walk us through it. Um, so he provided a notebook and this notebook has a variety of things going on in it. Um, you can see that it's got some standard imports, pandas, multiprocessing, timing, NumPy, et cetera. He's also written some custom modules and for functions that he's using to do that analytical work and that processing of these counts to make it human informative that he was talking about. And you know, that's something we're gonna have to look at as well. And so let's, you know, let's just actually go through this and take a look at what's happening. So Taylor's also created a timer object to help us understand how long things take, which is very helpful. And so this workflow is being distributed across cores in the system. It, currently I'm running it on the same machine I was using earlier. And it's, I believe this has 80 CPU cores, but in general, it's got some number of CPU cores. And in order to use all of them, it's gonna use multiprocessing. So this workflow is taking a bunch of samples from files and it's combining data frames. We can see that it's getting some information. It's going to try to read some data. If there's an issue, it's gonna do something. And then it's gonna return the combined data frame. That makes sense. This is called combined Cori data frames. And then we wanna parallelize that. We wanna parallelize that with the multiprocessing pool API, which is the standard canonical API for spreading Python work across multiple processes, each one using a different core. Then you map your functions with the pool mapper, and then you have to make sure that you join and close at the end before returning your data to synchronize. And with this, this parallelize essentially just takes an arbitrary function, it looks like, and it's going to take this function, it's gonna take some data and some number of processes, and it's gonna split the data into chunks. So in this case, by default, we're gonna split any data into eight chunks. And we're gonna create a pool of that many processes and map each chunk to one process. Then map the function to that data, run it in separate processes and bring it back together. Makes perfect sense. And then this function, run on subset, is it looks like a way to actually run the function, in particular running a function in a way that looks like it's gonna be a row-wise operation on a pandas data frame. This axis equals one. 
is a giveaway for those familiar with the pandas API that this is probably going to be a pandas data set, this, this data subset. We don't know that because we haven't seen it yet, but it's kind of a giveaway. And then there's this wrapper function, which is a wrapper around parallelize to allow passing arguments to this. It's using the func tools partial API to pass different arguments and things like that. So that's, that's it. So let's actually take a look at this workflow. There's a sample of data. This is not terabytes of data. That will take too long for us to go through. Um, this is a sample of data. I think it's some, I think it's a few gigabytes. I forget how much, but you can see that I haven't cleared my cell. It's going to be three and a half million rows and we're going to read this into memory. So it's going to take a little time. So while this is going, I'm going to explain, you know, what's going to come next in this workflow. So we looked through this and we saw that the first thing Taylor does is he sorts the data by time. Okay. Makes sense. Sorting by time. Then we can take a look at the data. This data looks like this. It's got a time column. It's got this column that anecdotally I know is going to be about these different systems and getting counters and these, these things, but I'm not well versed in this. We work with Taylor, get a better understanding. Then we get an understanding of what's actually going on. So in this case, the key aspect here is that there's 800 columns and there's, you know, three and a half million rows. So this is a large amount of data to process. We're going to do this kind of counting for every row. And we have millions of rows. We have hundreds of columns. And the counting logic is fairly complex, actually. But we also see that there's an identifier from which router this came from. It just looks like a hash or something. So Taylor has provided some examples of doing this. Um, this is you know, one of the parts of the workflow. And we can see that what's going to happen here is we're going to set up a pool. And he's doing this in a loop to get a sense of the scaling capabilities. So, you know, with one process, we're going to test this with different numbers of rows for I in range one to three. So one or two, we're going to go either 10 rows or hundred rows because J is 10 to the I and then take a sample and try this to see how it scales. And the rest of this code is about estimating that. So we'll run this. And we'll see it took about 10 rows for one, one process could, could do this aggregate VCs function that's being parallelized in about 1.6 seconds. So naively, if we have one process doing it in 1.6 seconds, we are really concerned already because we have millions of rows. And we see now we have linear scaling because when we scaled up to 100 rows, it roughly is about 10 times slower. 1.6, you know, let's call that one and a half. Let's call this 15. We're scaling linearly in processes. If we had four processes with 10 rows, it took maybe half a second. Four processes, 100 rows, four seconds. The estimated time on this machine to process all the rows at this rate is two and a half hours in this case. That is too long because this is a sample of the data. We can't wait two and a half hours. We have to speed this up. We know that. That's the goal. So let's see what happens next. This is the second part of the workflow. We had this aggregate VCs function, which we don't really understand yet. We know it, it runs. It does something on a, row by, on a row by row basis. We have this other function, which we also know does something on a row by row basis because we have parallelized on rows. And we can see how long this is going to take. Um, I think we have some intuition that this might be fairly time consuming. And we can see that in general, we're getting some good speed up when we go to more processes for this, a thousand rows only took four and a half seconds. A thousand rows took one and a half seconds and even one second with eight processes. So this actually runs a lot faster, but it still might benefit from speeding up. So at this point, we've got a sense of the workflow. We see that there's a clear bottleneck right here, but we don't really understand it. So now our job is to say, what's going on in these functions? We've gotten a sense of what's happening. We know that the output we want is this temp color data frame and it's created a bunch of new information columns in this data frame. We had 800 columns before roughly, or 843. Now we have almost 1,100 columns. So we've created a lot of new information at the end of this data frame, which is the goal. Lots of good stuff. So at this point, we're ready to say, well, what's going on in these functions? We noticed that, sorry, lost my place. All of these functions we're using come from this LDMS PP module the same one. It's the same one. So let's take a look at this LDMS PP module. We're importing it. 
Let's take a look. And please let me know if you'd like me to make the font larger. I'm happy to do that because I can see it's a little, maybe I'll just do it anyway. So this is a module with a lot of functions. I think you're in the wrong module. You're in oh, Slurp. Yes, I am. Thank you. Thanks, Taylor. So this is a function, but this is a module that also has a lot of uh, functions. Actually, might make this a little less large so we can see more at once. Um, but if it's too small, let me know. So there's a lot of functions here that we don't necessarily need right now. What we need to understand is what goes into this aggregate VCs or VCS function. What goes into this? So we'll find this function. And here we go. So this, in fact, there's actually two versions of this. This, this one was 10% faster. So this is the one we, that was part of the workflow. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. It's a, it's a fairly large function. So let's, let's try to unpack this. We know it's operating on pandas data frames. So we know that it has some in, implicit structure about how it does processing. And that processing is on a row by row basis. So this row is the unit of account essentially. This row is gonna have attached to it all of the columns in the data frame for that given row. That's sort of, that's just the way that we apply functions on pandas data frame. So we know that. So we can see there's some loops here. There's actually a nested loop. So we're doing something five times. And then for every one of those things, we're doing another thing eight times. So we're doing something 40 times. What are we doing? Well, we're creating some variables and initializing them to be zero. These are the flits. We are also creating some strings. And we're gonna create the strings based on where we are in these loops, it turns out. Okay, so we know that the looping logic is important for some kind of strings we're creating. Then we see the same thing, but it's now for stalls rather than flits. So it looks like F and S are these indicators that are prepended on these things to tell us what we're working on. And it's the same kind of information. You know, there's different things that are being created. You know, these look like you know, incoming packets versus incoming you know, flits. I'm, I'm not well versed in this domain, but it seems like we've gotten a sense of what's happening. We're creating some labels and we probably will do something with them. So then we get to some more logic. You know, for every one of these iterations, every time for every set of these things that we've created, we're going to loop through and grab the value from this column. So this column is presumably in the data frame and we're gonna grab the value, it's numeric because this data frame was numeric, and add it to this total, which we have up here. So we're doing a sum across several columns, in this case, four columns, and we're defining which columns we're using based on this R value, this C value, and this VC value in these loops. Okay, so this is a binary operation. We're doing a binary operation, and then we're doing a reduction. We're doing a sum, essentially. We're just, grab, sorry, we're, we're doing, sorry, we're doing a reduction operation. It's a, it's a sum. We're grabbing it, and then we're doing a sum. The total after the, after the binary operation of the addition. And so we know we're just doing addition and summation. So that's pretty good so far. We've got a sense of what's happening. We see it's happening again here. The same thing. Addition, summation, binary ops, reductions. Those are great. GPUs love them. Then we're doing some more addition. We're, looks like we're after we've gone through these, we're going to combine the VC rec and the VC resp to create the overall flits VCX and then the stalls VCX. And we're going to do something with these, presumably. Okay, here's the answer. Those labels we created up here, we created them. We're going to make a new column in the data frame and we're going to put that sum that we calculated up here or we initialized up here and we added to right here. We're going to make a new column and put that sum in there. And we're going to do it a bunch of times, actually. We're going to do it for that one, for this one. And we're going to do, then we're going to do the same thing for the stalls. We're going to take this stalls sum, this one, and this one. So for every iteration of this loop of 40, it looks like we're going to create six new columns. And we're going to do it for every row. Okay, that, that's pretty good. It seems like we have a, a pretty good sense of what's happening here. Let's take a look at our other function. Get per router counters by color. Well, 
what is this going to do? Let's find out. Here we go. Get per router counters by color. We're going to take in a row just like before, and we're going to initialize some things just like before, some, some counters presumably. And then we're going to loop through this index of the row. And so in this case, the index of the row is going to be all of the different identifiers associated with it. So what this is really saying is we want to loop through and evaluate, oh, I don't have it handy here, but it'll be on this one. We want to evaluate this router ID here, this C7, 5C1, blah, blah, blah. That's what this index is. And then, oh, actually, sorry, that's, that's, that's what the name is, I think. I think that's, that's what the name is. And then the index is going to be the actual, um, the actual columns themselves. So we're going to evaluate all of the columns. That's the index, getting my pandas logic mixed up. Um, we're going to evaluate all the columns and loop through them. And then so for every column, we're going to run this get tile number function on it. So that's going to give us something, some number. We'll come back to that. And if that, if that number is, doesn't exist, if it's none, we're going to just not do anything. We're going to skip. And then we're going to do some regex logic some regular expressions. This is a fairly clear pattern. We're going to capture a pattern of a C followed by some number of digits, then a dash, then some, some arbitrary number of digits, then a dash, excuse me, then a C, then some more digits, then an S, and so on. And then we're going to see if we can match this pattern to that name. And the name is this. This is the thing we're trying to match against right here, these things. And it makes sense. We see that there's the, the letter, the number, the dash, and so on. So that, that checks out. We're going to do this, and we're going to capture that last match, the eighth group. One, two, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we want that final one. And we're going to call that slot. OK. So you, know, you can see already this is a fairly um, you know, complex amount of stuff happening. It's taking a little time to understand. So now we get to some branching logic. We've got our slot, and if these tnums that we created, which we don't understand yet, but if this tile number is within certain conditions, there's some branching logic, we're going to do things. If this is the case, and if this column has flit vcx in it, you know, this one doesn't have flit vcx. Neither does this one. Neither does this one. But some of them do, presumably. If it has flit vcx in it, we're going to do some counting. And we're going to add the value in this column to the blue flits counter. If it's got robust, we're going to add it to the blue. Octal numbers, um, but they're not super important from the GPU perspective. We can just have the same branching logic with the octals. But we're going to have a new condition right now. This is, again, a condition that looks like it's got another subcondition that's a little more complicated. It's using that slot that we just had. So we're going to say if slot is less than 8 and flits are in the counter, flit VCX is in the column name, add it to green. Okay, so we're getting a sense that the color here is important. Same thing with stalls. And then we're going to add it to black if slot is greater than or equal to 8 because it's the else statement at this if loop. So we're getting a sense of what's happening. This logic then continues where this branching logic comes with this. So if this is not true, then we go to the else. And then we do the same logic, but for different things. At this point, then we're going to return, it looks like, some new columns that we're calling router flits black, router flits blue, flits green, etc. And these are just the sums that we've calculated. So at this point, I think we have a pretty good handle on this workflow. We're creating new columns that are summing up the counters from all these different you know, sensors or routers or that are coming through the, the system and spitting out the results. This is actually just like Taylor explained. It's great when it works out like that. Um, and so the next step we would have is, well, we know it's slow, but why is it slow? It's almost always the right approach to start profi profiling your workflow that exists already 
before doing anything else. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to use a tool, and I'm zooming out just for a moment so I can make this cleanly. I'm going to create a Python script to help me profile this. And I'm going to make a tool that, or I'm going to use a tool, excuse me, called SnakeViz, which I highly recommend um, for those who are, who are not familiar with it. It's a tool for visual profiling. And it does work in Jupyter Notebooks, but it will be cleaner to do it in a Python script. So I'm going to do it, do it here. Um, I'm going to actually not use any of this parallelism code because it doesn't actually affect the profile. Um, it's just going to ca it'll capture overhead, but it's going to make profiling very hard because it's multi-processed. So I'm not going to run this. What instead I'm going to do is grab the data. And let me actually make this a Python script first so you can see the syntax highlighting. Um, so I'm going to now load the data. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to call this LDMS profiling. LMDS, sorry. Live coding. And I'm going to use this to do the same sort, because obviously I want to make sure I run the same workflow. And I'm not going to run this multiprocessing. Instead, what I'm just going to do is run the function. Um, I'm just going to run it. I mean, that's very fine with me. Um, so I'm going to take these right here, and I'm just going to run them. I'm going to not run it on here. I'm actually just going to literally apply this to my data frame and say that temp dot apply LDMS aggregate VCs axis equals one. This is what's actually happening under the hood with the the parallelization, it's, it's doing this in parallel, but I'm not going to need to do that. Then I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to put in that set index. And then I'm going to run the same thing with this temp color for that last, that last step. But again, I'm not going to actually parallelize it. I'm just going to run it on the data set. And so I'm going to pass axis equals one manually. And so there we go. So at this point, this is the workflow. Then we'll have our results. And you know, I'll print them out at the end just for the sake of it. Um, but what we're going to do here is actually profile this. So I'm going to make a terminal. So I'm going to go into this directory, which I have in NERSC. And I'm going to go to L, because I just, I just cloned this for this example. And I have this saved in scripts, as you can see right here. It's in scripts. So I'm going to run this. now. I'm going to run this to create something called a Hey Nick, sorry to interrupt. Um we lost your sound. Can you hear me? Is it back now? Yeah, it's back now. Oh, sorry. I, my headphones are acting up. Apologies for that. Um, I'm not sure when it went out. But what I'm going to do here is profile the workflow using something called cProfile, and then visualize it in SnakeViz, which is a library um, that's for visual profiling. The cProfile is, is, is baked into Python. I'm going to save the result as this thing. And I'm going to run this. And uh, I have to activate my environment. Um, Um, one second, I have to get the name of the environment. There we go. OK. Um, now I'm going to run this, now that I have pandas available. Um, this is, I guess, a, a good lesson in, in making sure you're, you're in your conda environments that you think you're in. So this is going to run. And you know it's going to take a little bit of time to run. Um, not too much, but we know that there's a lot of data being read by the pandas data reader right now. So maybe it'll take 30 or 45 seconds. While this is running, I'm going to show you what SnakeViz is. So this is what I'm going to use to actually profile this with the visual profile. It generates really expressive visual results that make it really clear where you're spending time and make it so helpful for, helpful for drilling down into details. So this is what I'm actually going to do. Um, I don't need this dash dashboard anymore. Um, this is going to be done in a moment. What I'm going to do once this is finished is basically run this exactly. And so. I am going to 
take the results of this, this profile. Okay, so it's still going. It's taking, it's taking a bit of time to sort. Then it's just going to run the, uh, this apply, then this apply, and it should be done shortly, hopefully. Um, I guess this, this bakes into the point that this is a, you know, we need to, we need to optimize this. And so you know, after we do this profile, we'll hopefully get a sense of where, where we're spending a lot of time. And that'll give us insight into how to do this for the GPU. Um, probably should have okay, made this. Question. Point, so are you, you're profiling on the CPU, right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so is it informative uh, to, to look at where the CPU is spending time? Because maybe it's a totally different ballgame on the GPU. It's a great question. Um, so it is informative. And it's not informative for necessarily the reason of why it's going to tell you exactly where to go for the GPU or, to, or you know, where you're going to spend the same amount of time. Because to your point, you might not but it's very informative for thinking about how to attack the problem. Um, it's possible this profile will tell us that certain things are not necessary for a first pass to put on the GPU. You know, for example, right now, we are time boxed. We have 30 minutes until this session is over. And in these 30 minutes, we may not be able to finish the entirety of the workflow. But if most of the workflow is, is happening in terms of the time spent in several of the key functions, that is really informative for us to know. Um, does that make sense? Yes, I very much agree with you. I just wanted to make you say that. Oh, great. Awesome. Um, so this is probably my fault. I should have made this more like 10 or 100 because this is why it's taking so long. We saw that this thing scaled linearly, and we saw that one, this is going to, this is going to take 1,000 seconds. I didn't think this through. Sorry. Um, I'm going to kick this off again using 10 records. Um, and so we'll have to wait a little bit longer. But so while this is happening, um, I will go back to, I'll, I'll get us set up to do a Rapids version while this is being profiled. So in the Rapids version, we're going to want most of the same things uh, because you know, we are going to need these things probably. But I'm not going to grab them from the same libraries. I'm instead going to copy them from this script and bring them up. We know we need this get routers by color. So I'm just going to put it here so it's easier for us to see it. We know we need that. We know we need this other function, get tile number. And there it is. We know that this is something we need. This is getting a number from a regular expression pattern. We'll call these the original functions. We know we need these. We also know we need that aggregate VCs function, which is right here. So these are our functions. We, these are the things we're operating with. Um, okay, there, so this, this finished, great. So you can see now that I have a profile right here. I have a initial workflow.prof. This is a C profile, and it's, it's fairly scary to look at them if you're not experienced with it, but it's actually a very specific structure, and it's very straightforward once you understand it, which is that every line is essentially part of the call stack of everything that's happening, and it's just measuring time in the call stack. So what I'm going to do now is use snakeviz to, to visualize this profile. And so what I'm going to do is visualize this initial workflow.prof. I'm going to, oh, sorry. I'm going to not do that. I'm going to pass in some, some configurations that determine what ports to use and what's going on with the look. This is basically saying the local host on port 8080. And it's going to give me a web server. And so I'm going to go to this web server. And it's happening right here for me. This is our profile. So SnakeViz is going to make that icicle plot for us. So this took about 50 seconds. Most of the time was reading data. That makes sense. This was a very large data set. We didn't do that much compute. But this is also a fixed cost, so I'm not that concerned about it right now. I want to see where we did things. OK, well, we took some time sorting. That makes sense. That was also a fixed cost. We had to do that once. What about in our apply function right here? OK, so this is our apply standard. And we called aggregate VCs. That took 2.4 seconds out of 2.8. And we did a little bit of other things going on. We really didn't do that much. It looks like this get per routers counter is very little time spent. Almost all of the time in this, when the actual compute, the applies, Almost all of the time is in aggregate VCs, and a tiny bit is in get per router counter by color. 
that's consistent with what we expected from the pandas version that we saw this this function scale very very slowly but now we can see clearly that this is scaling slowly because of all this set item calls and in particular we're using these set item calls to create new columns. So the creating columns is what's taking really a long time here. And so that gives us insight into this workflow in general, but really the key thing here is that the next 30 minutes, let's not focus on get per router counters. We know that eventually we can do this because we've actually done this before. We've, we've done this in the past, but let's focus now on aggregate VCs because 98% or 95% of the time in this tiny example, and perhaps even larger in the real example, 99.5 probably, if we did this at scale, is spent in this function. So now we know. That's great. We can kill this profile. We're, we're good to go. We're ready to start. So in this case, we're going to still import this data set with pandas because it's a fixed cost, and the pandas HDF5 reader is what we're going to use because QDF doesn't yet support HDF5 uh, reading directly to GPU memory. So we're gonna read the data in, just like before. And so we can get a, a little more set up while that's happening. Um, again, we could sort this on the GPU. We saw that sorting is very fast on the GPU, but again, it's not super important because these are fixed costs. And so we can just run them. Um, I'm gonna switch this to not be an in-place operation, but still run the same sort. And when we're developing this workflow, we don't want to work on this total data set. This is a large data set. We saw it was three million, three and a half million rows. We want to work on a sample. And so I'm going to call this Corey sample. And I'm going to just take the first maybe 10 rows. And I'm going to make a copy. Um, that way we don't end up actually mutating the original data set. That's very, um, it's very often the case that we accidentally mutate data sets. And that's, that's what causes that setting with copy error um, that I mentioned earlier in the in the day. So I'm going to take a sample of this and I'm also going to have to import QDF because I want to do this in the GPU and I'm going to maybe I'll call, I'll call Corey sample GPU as QDF uh, from pandas. I'll do it in the next cell but um, I guess QDF data frame from pandas Corey sample. There we go. So this is, again, this is going to be quick. It's going to be, oh, ah, right. Okay. So QDF doesn't support this time delta timestamp, which is the way that pandas wrote, uh, read in this data. Um, we do support date times. We don't support this time delta. So we can find that column, this time delta. We weren't using this duration column in the workflow, so we can temporarily drop this. We could, of course, just cast it to a different time, we could do different things with this. We could change the structure to be instead of a time delta, we could use a start and an end. But for now, I'm just going to, I'm just going to get rid of it and say, we're going to drop duration axis equals one. Now this is the same way you drop a column in pandas, so it should look fairly familiar. And now we can put this on the GPU and I'll call this Corey sample GPU. So we should, as we know, be able to just run these functions. Like we should just be able to run this. So if we run Corey sample dot apply aggregate VCs, this should just work. And as expected, it does work. So that's great. So we know we've set things up correctly. So we want to mimic this function on the GPU. We need to start thinking about things in a different manner. This is operating on a row by row basis, doing operations on independent rows, one at a time, but it's doing independent operations. These operations, addition and then summation, right here, that's what this is, add and, and sum and set equal to, these are independent par reductions that could be done in parallel, and, or binary ops and reductions that could be done in parallel. So I suspect that there's a way we can take this logic and instead of having it work on a row basis, we could have it work on a column basis. And I suspect that would actually apply both to the CPU and the GPU. That's like the suspicion from looking at this function. That's sort of like the first way we approach this. Um, because if we can do that, we'll save a ton of time setting the columns once per column rather than once per column per row. 
So let's define a function. So let's define aggregate VCs, but let's prepend columnar aggregate VCs. And we, we don't want it to work on the row. We want it to work on the entire data frame. So that this is what we want. So we, we kind of have a sense of what we want to do. Let's operate on columns, not rows. That's like this loose sense that we have. And so we want to sum across rows, across specific columns in each row. Actually, that's what we want to do, right? We want to put into this new column a bunch of different information here that are coming from these four columns, then coming from these four columns that are defined by these loops. So we want to operate on columns. We want to sum across specific columns in each row. And we can probably do this in a couple of stages. We can probably do this in two stages. Let's do this in two stages. Let's first collect all the columns of interest. And so if we can collect all the columns at once that we, want to care, that we care about, we can then do a, do a single row-wise binary op and reduction, addition plus sum. And so this, in theory, it seems like we'll avoid a lot of the pain that, that it's coming from all these repeated calls. And so let's try to do that. So let's get rid of this pass. So we still need to generate the same columns. We still need to generate the same output columns. We need to do that. So we probably can't avoid this loop. Now, the first thing about this is it's, you're gonna wanna, or it's common for myself and for others probably to say, Loops are, are bad. Loops are time consuming. Can we avoid loops? And of course we want to avoid loops where we can, but sometimes we just need loops. And so when I'm looking at these workflows and thinking about how to profile and how to port them, we don't necessarily have to move the waterfall all at once. We can move the waterfall inch by inch. And so we can start by saying, well, we probably need these same output columns. So we might, we might need these loops still. So let's keep the loops. And you know, maybe we need this try we can still wrap these in a try except if in case there's an error, but you know, that's, that perhaps is not necessary, but it might be. So we probably need to do a lot of the same stuff. You know, we can start with the flits. So let's, let's start with the flits. And we, we might need all the same information. Let's find out. Well, we know we want to create these output columns. So we probably, we probably need these still. That's what we're creating. So these make sense. But do we need these counters? Do we need to initialize a counter to zero if we're going to do a, a single row-wise binary op? This binary op, we can use the pandas API or the, or the QDF API to do df.columns of interest. We can do that sum row-wise. This is what we can do. So we probably don't need to initialize these. We probably instead want to think about it a little differently. We definitely need these columns, I feel like. But we want to get the columns we need instead of initializing one at a time. Let's get the original columns we need for flits and stalls. So we, we need these kind of separated again. We have to do them separately for all these different things, right? Like we need this freak label to be this rec thing. So we know that we probably are going to want this loop still, but we want to do it differently. We need the columns of the, to create these columns. So maybe what we can do is say, get all the columns at once and add them to this list. And then we'll do the same thing for, for this, this, this uh, stalls VC rec. So we'll do the same thing there. And also, please stop me if there's any questions. Um, if that, or if, Laurie, if you think we should save them, that's fine too. Just let me know. Um, but so we're doing this, and we're essentially trying to unroll this loop, right? Like loop unrolling. This is the loop we don't want to do. And so I want to instead append them to these things. I want to say append this column. And I want to say append this column. And I guess I, I probably want to actually 
append them rather than just do it. So this is gonna do the same thing, except it's just gonna, it's not gonna do the computation. It's just gonna collect all the columns we care about. So, okay, that makes sense. So we've done something good there, I think. And we probably need to do this again, though, because we had a second loop. So we have this other loop over here. And we probably have to do it again because we need all the information to be the same. But so we probably should create some more columns. We should probably create the flits VC resp columns. And then do the same thing for SVC resp. And we probably, again, will want to do these appends instead. So we'll probably do dot append. We'll put this in. And then do the same thing for this stalls VC reps. And so all I'm doing is just adding, oh, not that. All I'm doing is just adding these to a list to keep track of them. So at this point, we actually haven't, again, we've done no computation, but we've collected the things that for a given iteration of this loop, we want to sum across. So that sounds good. That's actually really good. And so now um, we can probably- I got a quick, uh, sorry, I got a quick question here, uh, Nick. Uh, the append, wait, what is, F, uh, those are just lists, right? So append returns none, right? Oh, maybe it does, I might just be wrong. Uh, yes, it does. Thanks, Roland. Yeah, sure. Great. That makes it much easier. Oh, ah, crap, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Bad words. Um, anyway, so we're starting with the aggregate VCs. This is our original function that I accidentally just deleted. And so we can just append, which is in place. And so that was even simpler. And now we can probably do the sums, um, but we don't want to do it inside these loops. We want to do it only where we need it, which is this same level of this try. So let's do the sums. And maybe we'll put in the accept and just pass or, or whatever. Um, so let's do the sums. So there's a bunch of sums going on here. Um, you know, we, we need to kind of capture all of this information. This is the original information that we kind of have to capture. And so we want to add it to these rows. And so F, which is flits, so flits VC rec is going to be this freak label. So we can probably say that DF freak label, because we've defined the freak label up here. We still have this. So we can do all the rows at once and say that df freak label is probably just going to be the sum of all the columns for flits vc rec, these, row wise. That, that looks pretty good. So we can probably do the same thing for flits resp label, except we of course will have to use the correct columns, the flits VC resp. And so that looks pretty good to me. Um, we also have this new label one though. So this new label is the combination of flits VC rec and flits VC rep. Now, presumably I could actually now just do this by summing this thing I've created and with this thing, because I've, I've done that work already. Um, and in this case, I'm going to just make it a little more explicit, but we could probably optimize this. So I'm just going to be more explicit and say, this is just the sum of these because FVCX is the sum of both of these. And that's what this is going to be. So this is the sum of both of these. Now, again, we could optimize this by using these already computed sums, but for the sake of it, we'll just keep it for now. And so now we have to do the stalls. Um, so we've got these. So we can probably do the same thing because it's consistent logic. So we know we need this stalls rec label, which we've created up here, just, just like before. And now we can do the same thing. Um, presumably this is gonna be the 
stalls VC rec sum axis equals one. And you know, we, we're gonna make three of them again and I'll just preemptively fill them in. We know that again, we're gonna to wanna to have to, go, we're gonna to have to go to the stalls VC resp for the second row. And then the combined is probably gonna be the same as before as well, except we're gonna use the stalls version. So we're gonna put in the stalls VC rec and the stalls VC resp. So this is looking pretty good. Um, this is the same, the same computation. We've done it in a way that is not operating row wise. We're operating column by column. So we're using the entire data frame at, at once to take advantage of pandas's and really numpy's built in vectorization. And the reason I started like this is, you know, you might notice that nothing about this looks like it's on the GPU. The beauty of rapids is that this isn't code that is specific to the GPU. I'm writing generic pi data code. And so, Hopefully, at the end of this, at the end of this double for loop, which I am now at the same level of, I'm gonna return my data frame. And so I hope that when I run this, I'm gonna get the same results as when I do this. And so let's, let's take a look and, and see what happens. So, you know, I'll just make it even smaller sample. Maybe I'll take the two rows. This is our original function. You know, we can see that we added a bunch of things. Let's take our new columnar version. You know, we, we, it's very likely we made a mistake, or it's very possible we made a mistake because the, when you port things inter, you know, interactively and iteratively, iteratively, you often make mistakes. So this, you know, this function just takes in a data frame. That's all it takes in. This doc string sort of explains the logic that we tried to, um, to do. We'll take in the data frame, but in this case, we just, we'll take the first two rows to be consistent. And ah, there's no DF, it's a core sample. And so, you know, I'm getting a setting, with, a setting with copy error because I'm mutating this thing in place, which makes sense. Um, not an error, sorry, it's a warning, but um, I'll just avoid this by calling it temp. Okay. So, you know, we can see that, okay, hmm, looks like we might have done something incorrectly. We've got the same rows, we've got different values, but wait a minute, these are different columns. The ordering of columns might be slightly different depending on how we did things. It's possible that we have changed the ordering of columns unintentionally. So let's actually make sure we're taking a look at the same columns. So, res, so we'll, we'll save this as re, result columnar. We'll save this as res original. And let's take a look now, and let's let's look at this let's look at this column that you know hopefully we've created. So let's see if these are the same. Okay, so it looks like we didn't create something. Um, this doesn't exist. So let's debug this. Why does this not exist? Let's find out. Um, is it possible that we aren't appending something correctly. So this is the process of debugging. So we'll go back to the original code and you know, we'll take a look and we'll see, okay, well, maybe, um, sorry, I have, this, I have the original code open in a new tab, but I'll, I'll, I'll look at it here. You know, maybe there's something going on that we missed. Um, is it possible that we don't have these strings formatted correctly because we're missing a column? You know, we wouldn't expect to be missing a column. So let's take a look. Um, it looks like these could be formatted correctly, but let's actually be, you know, be explicit and take a look. So we'll get rid of these. And you know, it looks like they're okay. Um, but you know, we still might want to, to double check. Um, these could be verified more, more closely. But for now, we think, you know, these, are, these look like they're probably good. So maybe we have a logic error somewhere else. So perhaps we have a logic error in the column operations. Or maybe we are doing a sum that is, you know, not actually creating. So let's maybe, maybe we're getting an error. So let's see if we got an error. Perhaps some of these actually errored out. 
Looks like a bunch of them errored out. So let's let's actually see why this errored out. This we is really important. Say, Nick, uh, we think you're really brave for doing this all live, and uh, yeah, <laughs> we, we all have been exactly where you are. No, absolutely. Um, it's just part of the process. So you, when you're working with someone else's code, you're trying to port it in you know a live session or any session. No, it's not always clear what's happening. So we got some errors. Um, so let's catch the error. Um, let's just catch the generic exception as E, and let's actually print E and see what's going on. OK, look at this. These columns don't exist. So what's our problem here? Well, we've got our Cori sample. We've, we seemingly aren't able to index into this for really any of these, uh, of these rows. Like if we print out R, C, and E, looks like for all of these rows, we're not able to index in. So why is that? Let's, take, let's sort of try to understand that. So we've got these columns, and we know that this is going to be, or no, sorry, not that. We've got these columns, and we know it's going to be something that comes from our data frame. And so let's see what this would be. If we set r equal to 0, or say rcvc equals 0, 0, and vc is also could be 0. So this is, you know, something that we have, and we have perhaps Cori sample. OK, so this seems like it should have this, right? It seems like we should have this. So something is off. So what are the ones we don't have? We don't have this set. So why do we think this is the case? I wonder if perhaps it's because we're doing the lists incorrectly. That seems like it's, it's a very likely candidate. List handling is something that, you know, it's easy to screw that up. And there we go. So what did we just learn? I, what I just did was I looked just to make sure we had the columns. I saw that we did. So then it eliminated all of the work that wasn't operating on, a, on combinations of columns, kind of. And so then I double checked that by getting rid of the lists. And so in this case, presumably, I just need to, instead of using a comma to do this with like double, um, you know, double things right here, I presumably just need to actually just do this. And instead, these are already lists. I can probably just combine the lists like this. And I suspect now we will not get any errors. But, you know, fool me twice, or, you know. And there we go, success. So obviously in the real, in the real workflow, we would not just use two rows to verify that this is correct, but you know, it's nice to see that it's, it looks correct. And, and the logic made sense, so it should, it should be correct. But we would, of course, verify this actually. Um, and so at this point, you know, we'd say, OK, well, why did we do this? We didn't do this to improve the CPU code, which is nice. I mean, hopefully this has improved the CPU code. So let's actually take a look at the CPU code speed. And then we'll actually run this on the GPU. Um, so we have this Cori sample. And we know it, no, let's, let's say we know it works now. So let's just um, take this again. Let's take this farther down where we have some space. So what we're going to do is say, maybe look at 100 rows. And to run this, the original one, with 100 rows, this should be pretty quick, hopefully. But we know it's, you know, it's kind of slow. Um, we saw that. It was, I guess, in the other notebook, we expected it to be like roughly 1.6 seconds for every 10 rows with a single process. So this is probably going to be 10 seconds, yeah, 14 seconds. So let's say the, res, the result for the columnar is going to be, you know, hopefully a lot faster. And as expected, it's much faster. That's great um, because we are also going to run this in the GPU in a second. Um, so with 100 rows, it took this long. I'm not going to run this anymore because it's scaling linearly. So with 1,000 rows, it'll we'll be here forever. But like with 1,000 rows, this should be pretty quick, less than a second. So let's do it on the GPU now. This code will run on the GPU. All of these APIs exist on the GPU. We, we can run them. So let's do it. 
we can do the same thing that we did right here and say result columnar GPU on the Cori sample GPU. So the first time we ran this, we run this, it's gonna take a little bit longer because it's gonna JIT compile. Um, but so let's, we'll run it again just to avoid the, the JIT compilation. So it's 1.8 seconds. So it's actually a little slow. With a thousand rows, the pandas version was faster. And so why is that? Well, it's the way we, the way we ported this. We are doing 40 iterations. And within each iteration, we're making a call to sum six times. So we're doing 240 separate kernel calls, no matter how many rows we're doing. So if we do one row, we're making 240 separate kernel calls. If we do 1 million rows, it's the same thing. So there's, a, there's an overhead of, that, of those kernel calls. So let's see what that means. Let's go to 10,000 rows. So the pandas version, it's losing vectorization. So it's, it's gonna be much faster than the original. In fact, it hopefully will do 1,000 in the speed, you know, about 10 seconds or maybe. So the, the pandas one took less than a second and now it took about 10 seconds. So it looks like when we scaled up from a factor of 1,000 to 10,000, we scaled up linearly by a factor of 10. Our time scaled roughly linearly by a factor of 10. What about on the GPU? So we scaled significantly, significantly faster. Um, we can keep this time way down, you know, roughly in this case, 1.8 seconds again. What about 100,000? So I'm not gonna run this on the CPU because I can tell you that it scales linearly, like we know that, and it's gonna take, it's gonna take 120 seconds, so I'm not gonna waste the time. But with 100,000 rows, the GPU version will still take you know, two to three seconds. And with 200,000 rows, the GPU version will still take very little time. And so you know, the amount of time it's actually gonna take is gonna depend on how you, how you port it. You know, we know from above that you know, this is not the optimal port. You know, we, we could probably optimize this. We've already done some of these calculations. We don't need to do a kernel call here. We can actually just do a binary operation between you know, these two sums that we've created. We can also probably potentially even unroll some of these loops if we're clever about it. But you know, in general, we just went from 1,000 rows in 12 seconds with pandas with the improved CPU version to 200,000 rows in four seconds with the GPU. Now, obviously, that's great. You can do this whole workflow that we were estimating was going to take two and a half hours. We can, well, we, we can actually do it in like 30 seconds, which is just awesome. But it's also great because this code scales. Um, I'm not going to pull it up on a big cluster, but I'm just going to show you to demonstrate because we're almost out of time that we can put this on a Dask in a Dask data frame. So I'm using the Dask data frame API that we just used. Um, it's going to ask me to set a number of partitions. You know, this is a fairly sizable data set. It's got 200,000 rows, it's not too big. I'll put this in 10 partitions. It's not super important, I just need to do it. Um, so this is a Dask data frame. We can run this same code on that Dask data frame because none of these APIs are anything unique. This is Dask compatible. So you know, when Taylor mentioned earlier that this can, you know, his work, the actual workflow is in the terabytes of data, we can call this on the Dask data frame and it will run. Um, now to be clear, this is going to run and oh, it's, gonna, it's gonna print out. Um, so I, I need to, to stop this from printing out a lot of stuff. But um, this will run on the Dask data frame. Now the Dask data frame has 10 partitions and because we're not using any parallelism, it's going partition by partition. So in this case, using Dask like this is, is actually gonna be slower, but if we had a lot of GPUs, we could use this and split up this work incredibly efficiently. And if I just use one partition, it would be as if we were using a QDF data frame rather than a Dask QDF data frame, and it would be very quick. Um, but I just wanted to sort of show that this same code will run on the GPU um, with both QDF and with Dask. Um, this is taking too long, I'm being impatient. So I'm gonna actually recreate this as a single partition data frame. And I'm gonna run this again because I'm impatient. Um, but in general, this is, you know, Dask adds some overhead because it has to do orchestration and it's gonna do these sums a little bit differently, but it's gonna run. Um, and it's, it's actually, it seems to be adding a decent bit of overhead um, in this case, but 
in general, and it's running and it's taking a little bit more time because of the, you know, the overhead. But we could also run this with the Dask map partitions API and just pass this function. This is a way to pass functions to the underlying um, objects in memory. And there, so the, you know, that was just as fast. And so the result of this is a Dask data frame, but now it's a Dask data frame that has our results um, in it if we call persist. And we can see that the link, uh, the, if we do res.head, eventually it will finish. Um, well, that's the risk of live coding. But in general, um, this pattern will work. And you can see that you know, Dask is, is it's, it's adding some overhead, but it's allowing it to succeed. And so yeah, so that's how we would take this workflow. And you know, we didn't port the second portion yet. We ran out of time. But we ported the most important part that took up 95, 99% of the time, and we made it go from two and a half hours or you know, hours to in the, in the seconds. So that's how we think about this. We try to unroll loops where we can. We don't over-optimize before we get our speed ups and our wins. We think about columnar operations and aggregating all of our compute into as few operations as we can. And we try to use standard APIs. So hopefully this has been a good experience or a useful experience to see that. Um, and hopefully you can apply these kind of same, um, you know, profiling experiences and, and porting experiences to your workflows as well. Great. Thanks for showing that, Nick. I just want to say that it was really awesome. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it did finish. It took a little longer. The overhead is probably because this is a shared machine um, and Dask is probably being a little silly, um, but it does run. So it's nice. Hey, Nick, that was amazing. Uh, major props for doing that all live. So, okay, if you had to uh, distill down what you just demonstrated into like three or four steps, um, what would they be? Yeah, so I think in general, we always want to operate on columns, not rows. So if we can distill the logic down, I would say something like try to rethink your operations to operate on columns rather than rows. By doing that, it lets you use existing APIs. And that, that often is going to help your CPU code. You know, we saw down here that by restructuring this, we can improve the pandas version quite a bit. You know, it doesn't solve the problem because it's still going to take too long because it took 10 seconds for, a, for you know, a thousand rows or whatever versus four seconds for hundreds of thousands. Like that's not going to cut it, but it still made an improvement. With GPUs, that improvement is times a thousand fold. So that's why it's so important. That's one. Number two, don't try to over optimize before you get some, some wins. We don't want to move, you know, you don't move a waterfall all at once. It's inch by inch every year, the waterfall moves backward like five inches. That's like, you know, what happens? You can still get big speed ups by making the quick changes that you know, make sense. You know, we did this all in the span of realistically about 30, 40 minutes. Um, you know, we could of course optimize this. And in fact, if probably if I, had, if I had actually done that before, I wouldn't have made the mistake of trying to combine two lists incorrectly, but you know, little syntax errors happen. Um, but don't over optimize. Like, you know, maybe eventually now we could say, well, do we even need these? Like, do we have to do all these separate sums? Can't we do this in, you know, in some other way that combines these kernel calls and fuses them? Maybe yes, maybe no, but we don't know that until we try, but we don't need to try until we know that it's necessary. This optimization makes the entire workflow on like three, three and a half million rows run in you know, less than a minute-ish. So maybe that's fine. Maybe we don't need to get faster than that. Um, going from you know, two and a half hours to a minute might just be enough. Um, and so don't try to over-optimize. Um, number, number three would be actually measure correctness. You know, we didn't do that here. And, you know, we kind of just eyeballed it because we're doing it. You know, we were just eyeballing it. But it's important to do more than just actually say, oh yeah, these are the same, these are the same, these are the same. Actually measure correctness. And you know, we, actually put, we actually put out a blog uh, recently on, on the, semi-recently, on the Rapids Medium page about you know, measuring correctness in workflows. Um, I'll pull it up quickly if I can, if I can find it. Um, but if not, no issue. Yeah, so here's an example. We put out a blog for, for doing this, like verifying correctness. There's a, there's a bunch of things that you're gonna wanna check. Things like the types, are the indexes actually the same? Are the columns in different orders? Are you perhaps using different precision? 
you know, perhaps some of the operations when they're done in parallel, it's not actually correct or incorrect, but parallel math can sometimes give you differences in you know, double precision than serial math. It's not that actually one is more correct than the other, they're just different. Um, it's important to think about that. Um, and so we put together a checklist and I'll share this in, in the chat as well, but make sure that you really do measure correctness because there's nothing worth doing if you're trying to actually solve a research problem or an infrastructure problem in this case, if you think you solved it faster, but you actually haven't. Um, and then, you know, one thing I would say is come back with a fresh mind. That's probably the fourth thing. After this, you know, you know, right now we've done a good job. Hopefully we made a couple of mistakes. We found them pretty quickly. Eventually we might find a new way to come back to this, but we don't want to, you know, belabor the point. If we can get a win, we got a win and that's great. Um, you know, this workflow is now fully on the GPU. Um, obviously we didn't port the second function, but we did port the second function um, with Taylor originally. Um, and again, it's, it looks quite similar to this. The, the way we ported the second function, get, you know, the get per routers, it's very similar. We took things and made them more columnar. We split up the logic of this, uh, this slot process. We actually, we took this and uh, we took this process and made it happen once in a columnar fashion because we were able to leverage columnar regular expressions, each thread on the GPU doing one at the same time. So we could do literally hundreds of thousands at once. And then we turn these if statements into essentially operate once on filtered data frames where slots less than eight and once on filtered data frames where slot is greater than or equal to eight. And we just did the aggregations like that. And so that sort of two stage process is the same as we did just right here. And it again, gave a very significant speed up just like this. So hopefully that's been useful. Time for a couple questions before break. I wanted to also thank you, uh, Nick, for the live coding exercise and for, uh, for Taylor for being so brave to share, uh, share his code. Uh, it's just to show that I actually do something, right? I don't <laughs> okay, um, feel free to ask questions during the break. Uh, we can come back in you know, 10, 15 minutes, whatever the schedule says, um, and then continue the discussion. Yeah, okay. So um, what I want to um, suggest is that we do go ahead and we, we take that break uh, and uh, we plan to reconvene uh, maybe a little bit ahead of schedule, maybe uh, just before 3.30. Um, but um, I did want to mention that we are going to get back together for uh, kind of open Q&A, uh, some closing remarks, and there's going to be an attendee survey, which uh, we'll share in the chat here, and we'll want uh, people to fill that out. We're also going to email that to everybody. Um, but I, I, I do realize that um, for a lot of people on the call, it's getting late. Uh, for Nick, uh, it's getting late. For Zara, if she's still on. Um, but uh, if, you, if you do plan to drop off uh, here at the break, um, just watch for that email, but we would really uh, encourage people to stick around for the last part, uh, especially because there's probably a lot of um, questions and answers, but uh, questions. But um, yeah, during the break, be thinking about those, but um, I'll reconvene us maybe 3, uh, 325 if that sounds okay. All right. And you know, just a note, while I know the break just started, um, I, I just ran this on a million rows, um, just for the sake of it. We did a million rows. I, oh, sorry, it's actually, that was only 100,000, excuse me. Never mind. I am incorrect, but I will run this on a million rows and we'll see how long it takes, but. So stay tuned. Stay tuned. So in a, in a different scenario, we would obviously not be doing all these copies. We wouldn't be doing it like this. We would just kind of read it in. But in this case, one million rows, columnar, not perfect. You know, we could have optimized it more, as we said, like this is like, this is a waste of computation. Like it is objectively a waste. We could just do this with addition because we've already, we've already done both of these sums, but that's okay. Even without optimizing, we did a million rows just now in four and a half seconds. 
and it took us 12 seconds to do this with 10,000 rows in pandas. It took us one and a half seconds to do this, one and a half seconds to do it with 1,000 rows. So with 1,000 rows in pandas, this took, oh well, 10,000 rows. 10,000 rows, it's gonna take 10 seconds. With a million rows, it takes half the time on the GPU. So we did it in one, you know, 50% of the time or in one third of the time, we could do um, 100 times as much compute. So that's a 300, you know, loosely a 300 times speed up, which is awesome. That's just really exciting. And that's all I got.